Good evening, and welcome to St. Louis Church. Today we're celebrating the feast day of St. John Vianney. Please stand. of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. My brothers and sisters, as we begin together these sacred mysteries, we say together the first penitential prayer. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask Blessed Mary of the Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Glory to God in the Oh, my God. 
Let's pray. Almighty and merciful God, who made the priest John Saint Vianney wonderful in his pastoral zeal, grant we pray that through his intercession and example, we may in charity win brothers and sisters for Christ and obtain with them eternal glory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of Leviticus. The Lord said to Moses, These are the festivals of the Lord which you shall celebrate at their proper time with a sacred assembly. The Passover of the Lord falls on the fourteenth day of the first month at the evening twilight. The fifth day of this month is the Lord's Feast of Unleavened Bread. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, on the first of these days, you shall hold a sacred assembly and do no sort of work. On each of the seven days, you shall offer an oblation to the Lord. Then on the seventh day, you shall again hold a sacred assembly and do no sort of work. <clears throat> the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the children of Israel and tell them, When you come into the land which I am giving you, and reap your harvest, you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, who shall wave the sheaf before the Lord, that it may be acceptable for you. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall do this. Beginning with the day after the Sabbath, the day on which you bring the wave offering sheaf, you shall count seven full weeks, and then on the day after the seventh week, the fiftieth day, you shall present the new cereal offering to the Lord. The tenth of this seventh month is the Day of Atonement, when you shall hold a sacred assembly and mortify yourselves and offer an oblation to the Lord. The fifteenth day of this seventh month is the Lord's Feast of Booths, which shall continue for seven days. On the first day there shall be a sacred assembly, and you shall do no sort of work. For seven days you shall offer an oblation to the Lord, and on the eighth day you shall again hold a sacred assembly and offer an oblation to the Lord. On that solemn closing you shall do no sort of work. These, therefore, are the festivals of the Lord, on which you shall proclaim a sacred assembly, and offer as an oblation to the Lord burnt offerings and cereal offerings, sacrifices and libations, as prescribed for each day. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For it 
there is a statue in Israel, an ordinance of the God of Jacob, who made it a decree for Joseph when he came forth from the land of Egypt. Sing with joy to the Jesus came to his native place and taught the people in their synagogue. They were astonished and said, Where did this man get such wisdom and mighty deeds? Is he not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother named Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas? Are not his sisters all with us? Where did this man get all this? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except his native place and in his own house. And he did not work many mighty deeds there because of their lack of faith. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. It's always amazing to ponder on the fact that the human heart is able to create so many illusions when it comes to life and to convince itself of what normally would be seen as being good and beautiful and true as something that must be a mistake. It's too good to be true. It's not possible that it's here. In the Gospel passage, these are people who have known Jesus throughout his whole life. He returned to Nazareth as a very young child. They were able to observe him growing up, the interactions within that family between Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. They would be very much aware of the depth of his virtue, the goodness that is manifested not just by the child Jesus, 
but also by his parents. We refer to them as the Holy Family for the very specific reason. Their whole lives were centered on obedience to God and of service to neighbor. So they know that Jesus is someone exceptional. They've observed it for many, many years. And yet, when he appears in their midst, as he's begun his ministry, and they've heard the stories, it's not possible. How can this be? And immediately, what they begin to do is to put on Jesus all of the labels that they know. He's our carpenter's son. He's the brother of so-and-so. He's the son of Mary. And whenever any of us put a label on another person, that's definitely a sign that we don't want to listen to them. We put a label so as to put them aside, which is what the people of Nazareth do. Jesus is put aside. What we need to hear and what they, the citizens of Nazareth, need to hear is what is at work in that first reading from the book of Leviticus. Moses is talking to the people about the festivals of the Lord. What Moses is talking about is every one of us, we've been created for God. We are more than just the work we do, or the knowledge that we have, or the connections that are part of our life. We are here in time, but every one of us is destined for eternity. That certainly included us, was his whole goal in working in that small village, to remind people that they belong to God and that it was extremely important to connect with God. So what Moses offers, which is what we do this this very day, is what he calls these sacred assemblies. This is what we have today. And the festivals of the Lord. The days on the calendar that are set aside that we might keep them holy, that we might let go of the work that we normally do to truly be ourselves, our true selves, in the presence of God. And the festivals of the Lord invite us to remember two things. Every one of us, it is important that we take the time and use these holy days that are given to us to carve out a place for the Lord. Where we remind ourselves who we belong to and are able to listen and to welcome his word and to voice our prayer, our gratitude, our thanksgiving for the multiple benefits that we receive from God's great generosity. But there's also something else that is at work. On these holy days, these festivals, these are days that are given to us so that we can connect with God, but that we might also connect with those that we love and who are a blessing in our lives. the time that we spend with our loved ones, the meals that we have with them, the, con the conversations that occur, the different activities that we might do together, are not just things that fill our day and give us a certain contentment at the end of the day, but they strengthen the bonds of love, within a particular family or a community and are reminding us that we're called to be like the Holy Family, a reminder
reflection of the truth of heaven here on earth. And it is given to us if we take seriously the Lord's invitation and do with the festivals what we are called to do. A day set aside for God and a day set aside for those that we love. When the Cure d'Aus arrived in that little village, the majority of the people were very indifferent to God. They were busy living their lives and looking as best as they could for happiness, contentment, peace within their hearts. Just as the citizens of Nazareth were very busy with their lives and kept themselves busy with what they considered to be important. But there is a big difference between the inhabitants of those two communities. The good people of Nazareth, and they were good people, they were full of themselves, very much aware of the righteousness that they were doing. And because they were so devoted to the things of God, were convinced in the depths of their heart that they had no need for God's intercession, that they had no need for God's involvement in whatever they were doing, because there was nothing wrong with them. And because it's a spiritual pride, and that's what it is. It becomes a great barrier to the working of faith and receiving the gifts of God. The citizens of the little community of ours, as bad as they were, had an advantage. In the moments that they were honest with themselves, they knew that the lives they were living were not bringing them peace or satisfaction, that they were not happy. There was a restlessness there. And as the Curé d'Aus made them aware of this invitation that comes from heaven, they began to recognize that he might be the one to guide us to what we need, what we cannot find by ourselves, and what we know we do not have at this moment. And if the holiness of the Kiriabas was a magnet to these people, there was also an ability in their lives to respond wholeheartedly. And they were able to let go of what was not of God, so as to be embraced by everything that is of God. Faith is always the door by which the things of God become a reality in our lives. But if that door is never opened, impossible for the Lord of all creation to do any form of violence to interfere with our lives. He does respect whatever decisions we make, even if they are harmful to ourselves. But when we allow ourselves to truly receive, there is there an abundance that will overwhelm an abundance that brings about a tremendous amount of healing, but also with new strength, so as to be a help and a guide and a blessing to our neighbors. That is what the Holy Family was able to do in the small village of Nazareth, and that is what all of us are called to do if we are willing to 
somehow make time to be faithful to the things of God and to allow ourselves to waste our time with those that we love and who are always a blessing in our lives. As disciples of Jesus, always attentive to his word, we take time now to pray for the needs of the world and of the church. For the clergy, may God bless them in their service to the faithful, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For world leaders, may they be filled with wisdom to govern for the good of all, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who are alienated from their faith, may God bring upon them his faithful and healing presence, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For this community of faith, may we be strengthened to recognize God more fully here in our midst, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have passed away, may they be granted peace in Christ, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all the priests of the Diocese of Portland and an increase in vocations, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Holy God, on this day dedicated to St. John Vianney, not only do we open our hearts, but we place our hands in your loving care, very much aware that all that we have is a gift that you have bestowed on us, a gift that we are to share with our brothers and sisters. Inspired by this holy man and faithful always to your word, let us be faithful to this task, always in the name of Jesus, for he is Lord forever and ever. Amen.
pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Receive, O Lord, we pray, the offerings placed on your altar in commemoration of blessed St. John Vianney, so that as you brought him glory, you may, through these sacred mysteries, grant to us your pardon, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just our duty, and our salvation. Always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For on the festival of St. John Vianney, you bid your church rejoice. So to you strengthen her by the example of his holy life. Teach her by his words of preaching and keep her safe in answer to his prayers. And so, with the company of angels and saints, we sing the hymn of your praise, as without end we acclaim. created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you gather all things to yourself and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you by the same Spirit, Graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this all of you and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven. And as we look forward to his second coming, 
we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your Church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son, and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant, Francis our Pope, and Robert our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. Thank you. 
behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Yeah. 
May partaking at the heavenly table, Almighty God, confirm and increase strength from on high to all who celebrate the feast day of blessed St. John Vianney, that we may preserve in integrity the gift of faith and walk in the path of salvation you trace for us through Christ our Lord. Jesus, we 
Good evening. As you can see, we have already exposed the Blessed Sacrament for this evening uh, because we, we just had a Mass beforehand to celebrate the feast day of our beloved Curé of ours. Tonight we can complete this novena, this nine-day novena, for which we pray for an increase in vocations to the priesthood in the diocese, as well as for the priests of our diocese. The theme today is that of, our, of Mary, our spiritual mother. As we'll learn in the reflection later this evening, Mary was very much a part of the curé's life. And so now, let us gather ourselves for a moment. And I will read the Gospel reflection, and we'll have some time of quiet before going into the reflection. But at this time, let us gather ourselves in the presence of the one who loves us so much. Day nine, Mary, our spiritual mother. A reading from the Gospel according to St. John. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, woman, Behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that moment, from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home.
Well, we made it. We made it to day nine of this novena. And one of the things that I've learned in my time in seminary, and it might have been because my seminary was named after St. Mary, uh, Mount St. Mary's, is that we always ended any retreat, any conference, any series of talks, we always ended with a tying it all in with Mary, our mother, as our mediatrix, our mediator, our spiritual mother. And so I think it's quite fitting, especially with this saint, who is also uniquely connected to some other Marian devotions, which we'll talk about shortly. But I think it's quite fitting that this, this small priest, parish priest in little R's, gave himself over to the mothership of Mary in order to live out his ministry as a priest. As you know, priests take on the celibate state, whereas they do not take on a wife, a spouse, have physical children of their own. And so the life of a priest can be lonesome and isolated. But even, even in the celibate state, the priest must have a woman figure in his life. And the perfect one is the model for the church, and that is Mary, our mother. Jesus, as we read in the gospel passage, gave his mother to us as a great gift and intercessor for us. It started with the example of St. John, his beloved disciple. He gave her over to him giving her as his mother, or her as his mother, and in doing so, opened up the entire world, all of humanity, to receive the mothership of Mary. And so for John Vianney, this began at a very young age. So being the oldest of six children, his mother often offered John Vianney to God and the Blessed Virgin, and at his baptism made a secret vow to consecrate him to the altar. A woman who attended his mother at the birth of John Vianney and at his baptism exclaimed, either this child will be a great saint or a great villain. Well, I think if it's any indication over the last nine days, we, we know the answer to that one. Growing up, John Vianney, as we talked about in Vianney as a model of prayer, he was very devoted to the small prayers of the family, including the Hail Mary, the Rosary, and other devotionals. But as a young boy, he had one prized possession that he had, and it was that of a small statue of Mary. And in France, as we've come to know during the time of the French Revolution, people in possession of something like that were sent to the galleys or punished or put into prison for keeping a small, even a small statue of the Blessed Virgin because it represented something that was contradictory to the, the, new, the new era that the French people wanted to bring in, in a post-Christian, post-Enlightenment age. One of the, and one of the things with that statue, he imagined doing Marian processions. He always had that statue with him, always clutched in his hand or in his pocket, reminding him of the importance of Mary in his spiritual life. As we know with his, during 
his seminary formation, he struggled. He left to go on retreat, coming back fully enriched and ready to go. But then he received the word that his mother died. And then he went back to seminary and again was faced with failing in academics and ultimately after six months dismissed from seminary. As is fitting and as one would do, he went to his mother's grave and wept. And I cannot think of a more normal thing to do and I cannot think of an, an act more incomprehensible to a world that doesn't think about, reflect on the motherhood, the importance of motherhood in life as we know with our culture against life and other things. And while he was weeping at that too, yes, he, he wept and he recognized his mother before him as his physical mother. And he did ask her, because she was at the very least in purgatory, praying for him, asking for her intercession. But at that point, he took on a new mothership, that of taking on Mary as his mother, his spiritual mother, his mother in his ministry, and whatever, thing, every, whatever trouble would come his way. It was at that time of struggle he consecrated himself to Mary. Maybe not in the same uh, laid out process as St. Louis de Montfort's consecration, but nonetheless, he recognized the importance of laying down, as much as laying himself down at the foot of the cross, it's also laying himself down at the foot of Mary, giving himself to her, and she in turn gives all the graces that she has, as well as that of her son. As I mentioned, the priest must be in measure a solitary man to be like Christ. And like Christ, St. John Vianney in his priesthood, he had a struggle for solitude, having, he having to hear confessions for so many hours and to be in the public presence of the people. But even in that busyness with all the people, there's an importance of solitude because it is a cure for loneliness. And one of the ways he did that is he turned to his maternal memory, but also as a point of departure into the supernatural solitude of Mary. For as Mary, as the mother of God, she is everything. As a mother of the substitute, started when Christ gave John to her, she is everything as that mother, a substitute mother for us. And one who turns to Mary becomes her child. In our, especially with our Protestant brethren and even in our own society, there's an immaturity and there's been an impatience with the title of Mary as the Mother of God. That it has been, that it's been impatient with that rather than our own title as children of God by virtue of our baptism. But if you think about it, if souls attain heaven by becoming children, then they also attain heaven by locating their mother. And she is our mother for having carried one in her womb. And that one was the one who carried the world on his shoulders and gave everything for everyone. Mary is the model of the church. She's the only model of the church just by being a mother, the mother. Because nothing, as 
we we can see in the, in the history of our church. Nothing great can be done in the church without a woman having to share in it. Yes, women do not partake in the sacrament of holy orders, but by their femininity, by their beauty, by their grace, they inspire and show a motherly affection to their priests or their sons who become priests. And also we have in the this history saints of religious kinds or even mothers of saints, giving them an example and pointing them to go, the priests and the church to go in the direction of Christ. Some examples of that is Saint Monica, praying for her sinful son Augustine, praying for him for 20 years, and then he converted and became one of our great doctors. We have Saint Catherine of Siena, who told the, the Pope in his exile into France to get back, on, back to Rome and get back on that chair and lead the church. We also have the great mystical saints of St. Teresa of Lisieux and St. Teresa of Avila, who have given us a way to peer into the spiritual life and grow in our encounters with God. Priests in the confessional and also in our own lives, and even all of us too, deal with confession, uh, temptations. John Vianney considered quite the innocent person when he first was hearing confessions. He was, pre uh, he was exposed to sins he may have not ever really thought about. And so, and so one of the things that kind of startled him and disturbed him was some of those sins. But dealing with temptation dealing with hearing these sins and hearing some of the things that could come from them, John Vianney proposed a wild solution but that was simple and some people may find as naive or taking it as if something that he was afflicted with temptations. But he would say the Regina Chaley prayer six times and exclaim following those the reciting of the Regina Chaley, he would say, Blessed be forever the most holy and immaculate conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God. Just as when we are faced in times of temptation, of temptation of sin or to take bad action, turn to Mary. Invoke your mother, go to your mother, because she will help you in your time of need. Now, John Vianney is quite known for speaking about Mary in his homilies. And so I put in basically one of these talks that he did about Mary that I couldn't really paraphrase it or put into any better words. But when speaking of Mary, John Vianney said, the Father takes pleasure in looking upon the heart of the Most Holy Virgin Mary as the masterpiece of his hands. For we always like our own work, especially when it is well done. The son takes pleasure in the heart of his mother, the source from which he drew the blood that has ransomed us, the Holy Ghost as his temple. The prophets published the glory of Mary before her birth. They compared her to the son. Indeed, the apparition of the Holy Virgin may well be compared to a beautiful gleam of sun on a foggy day. Before her coming, the anger of God was hanging over our heads like a sword ready to strike. As soon as the Holy Virgin appeared upon the earth, his anger was appeased. She did not know that she was to be the mother of God, and when that she was a little child, she used to say, when shall I see that beautiful creature who is to be the mother of God? The Holy Virgin has brought, forth, brought us forth twice in the Incarnation and at the foot of the cross. She is then doubly our mother. The Holy Virgin is often compared to a mother. 
but she is better still the best of mothers. For the best of mothers sometimes punishes her child when it displeases her and even beats it. She thinks she is doing right, but the Holy Virgin does not do so. She is so good that she treats us with love and never punishes us. The heart of this good Mary, this good mother, is all love and mercy. She desires only to see us happy. We have only to turn to her to be heard. The Son has his justice, and Mary has nothing but her love. God has loved us so much as to die for us. But in the heart of our Lord there is justice, which is an attribute of God. In that, mo in that most holy virgin there is nothing but ver mercy. Her Son being ready to punish a sinner, Mary interposes, checks the sword, implores pardon for the poor criminal. Mother, our Lord, would say to her, I can refuse you nothing. If hell could repent, you'd obtain, it, obtain its pardon. We can say, there's a great saying that when praying, just go to the MVP, all stars, the all pro, if you will, and that's Jesus, of course. But sometimes, even the great MVPs, they all have a mother. And sometimes if you need to get a hold of them, the best person is to get a hold of their mother. Mary places herself between her son and us. The greater the sinners we are, the more tenderness and compassion she feels for us. Why not run to her? Run to her. Ask for her grace to help us to get away from our ways of sin and to go and return to the Lord. Mary acts as a shield, but also acts as a way, a door that opens us to her son. John Vianney had a great devotion to the Ave Maria, or Hail Mary. For him, he saw that prayer as something that is near her wearisome. It creates the devotion to Mary sweet, nourishing, and wonderful. Because we cannot go into a house without speaking to the porter, and Mary is that porter or portress into heaven. The Hail Mary, as we know, speaks of, is filled with scripture, but speaks of Mary's yes, her fiat, her yes to being, the, being accepting Jesus into her womb, becoming the mother of God. It's a reminder that because of her yes, we have our Savior. Because of her yes, we can turn to her as our, her, our, as our mother. All that the Son asks of the Father is granted him. All that the mother asks the Son is in a like manner granted to her. When we go to Mary, we handle something so fragrant and it perfumes whatever they touch. It, being in her presence perfumes us. So we should let our prayers pass through the hands of the Virgin because she will perfume them and present them to her son. John Vianney said, I think that at the end of the world, the Blessed Virgin will be very tranquil, but while the world lasts, we will drag her in all directions. The Holy Virgin is like a great mother who has great many children. She is continually occupied in going from one to the other. Just like an example of a mother with her children, she never wearies being ready and available for her children. And let us, we should always seek her veil, her presence, her love in our lives. 
So that's about Mary. Now we talk about her visitations to John Vianney. We don't know how many times she visited the Cure of ours. We do not have only one witnessed account where on May 8th, in 1840, a certain uh, lady named Madame Dury came to the rectory to drop off some things that she had been given um, for, the, uh, for the poor. She heard some voices in the second floor. And as she, she was also the, the caretaker of the house, she went up to the second floor. As she approached, she heard that one of the voices was a woman's voice. And this voice in a quiet manner said, what do you ask? She could then hear and recognize the far less musical voice of John Vianney reply, O oh, most loving mother, I asked for the conversion of sinners, the consolation of the afflicted, the relief of the sick, and more particularly of a person suffering for a long time and now praying for death if she cannot be cured. Madame Dury heard this and felt quite certain that she was being the one talked about because she was struggling with a dis uh, illness, painful illness. The other voice answered John Vianney saying that she will be cured, but not yet. At that point, Madame Dury opened the door because it was already slightly ajar. And according, in her words, this is what she saw. What was my surprise to see standing by the fireplace? A lady of middle height, clad in robe of dazzling white, sewn with golden roses. Her shoes seemed to be white as snow. Her hands gleamed with the richest diamonds. Her brow was circled with a crown of stars shining like the sun. I was dazzled when I, when I could finally lift my eyes to her. I saw her smile sweetly. Madame Dury cried out, My sweet mother, take me to heaven. Her response, later on, my child, My mother, my time is now. And she replied, you will always be my child, and I shall always be yours. Then the figure vanished, leaving Madame Dury and St. John Vianney, who was kneeling with his hands pressed against his chest, staring straight ahead. He remained like that for a while until Madame Dury tugged at his cassock. It, John Vianney woke up as if startled, and he's like, my God, is that you? And Madame Dury said, no, Father, it is I. Vianney looked at her, and she asked, did you see it? Did you see the lady? I, too. Who is she? He said, if you speak of it, you will never, uh, uh, who is she? John Vianney said, he got very serious, and he said, if you speak of it, you will never sit for here again. And then she said, may I tell you what, Father? I thought it was the Blessed Virgin. The curé grinned a little, and he said, you were not wrong. John Vianney had a very intentional focus on his humility. He didn't want any more a, a popularity or curiosity because he was now receiving visions from the Blessed Virgin. But, but just in that one encounter, we can see his love, his devotion, his attention to Mary. The other thing that John Vianney always did in his parish was encourage his people to pray the rosary. As you can see on this statue and also the other statue that we have here in the parish of John Vianney, he always, is in a hand, he always has his hands clasped in prayer, but he's holding rosaries. Even though he wasn't necessarily involved with Our Lady of Lourdes, 
because he died only one year after the visions, the visitations of Mary appeared to St. Bernadette in 1858. If you go to Our Lady of Lourdes, the shrine of Our Lady of Lourdes, there's a, the beautiful cathedral basilica of Our Lady of Lourdes. There's a huge courtyard in which many processions and candlelight vigils are done. But then right at the end, all the way back, is a statue of St. John Vianney on his knees, looking up imploringly at the Blessed Mother. In final words, I return to John Paul II's retreat for priests but before I do that, I just want to say we need to rely on Mary and pray to Mary for more vocations. Mary is our intercessor, our mother. And if we bring these prayers and our needs to her, she cannot cease to do that. John Paul II said in his retreat for priests, Laity and priests can never be resigned to see the number of priestly vocations of our nations reduced, as is the case in many dioceses. We can even see that here in our own. This resignation would be the bad sign for the vitality of the Christian people and would put its future and its mission at risk. It would be ambiguous to organize the Christian communities as if they could very largely do without the priestly ministry. Under the pretext of facing the near future with realism, on the contrary, let us ask ourselves if we're doing all that is possible to awaken in the Christian people the awareness of the beauty and the necessity of the priesthood, to awaken vocations, to encourage them and bring them to maturity. So what is our job? What is our mission following this novena? I think it begins with praying daily for our priests, praying for happy, holy, healthy, humble men to generously respond with their lives for the bride of Christ, the church, to become, to conform themselves, to take up the cross of Christ as a priest. I think it's also especially, and it's such a wonderful blessing to be in this parish, St. John Vianney Parish, that asking the inter through the intercession of our parish patron saint and the Blessed Virgin, asking for their intercession to pray for our priests, to pray for vocations. I think also, as is the case even without this novena, we need to stay close to the sacraments, especially that of reconciliation in the Eucharist. And lastly, as we get ready to say our last prayer, love your priests. Give your priests love and thanks for their fiat, their yes, responding to the call of Christ to go out into the labor in the vineyard. We have, you could have been faced with a bad experience with a priest of the past or there are other struggles with priests. But priests bring us Christ. So love your priests, pray for your priests, and pray for more priests. I now invite you to open your booklet to page 20 for day nine of our novena. St. John Vianney, from a young age, you had a great devotion to our Blessed Mother, relying constantly on her intercession. In doing so, you recognized Mary as your mother and realized that through your devotion to Mary, you, give, you in turn gave full devotion to her son. Help our priests become devoted to our Blessed Mother and encourage active devotion to her by all the faithful. Encourage those who are discerning to ex also accept Mary as their mother and seek her intercession. As Christ entrusted Mary to be the mother of the church, let all priests and those discerning receive Mary as their mother 
and fly unto her protection in times of need, in need. Believing in the power of your kind intercession, we humbly ask you to pray for us in the special intention we are hoping God will grant us through this novena. In particular, we pray for an increase in vocations to the priesthood here in the Diocese of Portland, and we pray for our priests who serve in this diocese. I also invite you to offer your own intention. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. If you turn over the page, we can do the Litany of St. John Vianney, the Cure of ours. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, hear us. God, the Father of heaven. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world. God, the Holy Spirit. Holy Trinity, one God. Holy Mary, Mother of God. St. John Marie Vianney. St. John Vianney, endowed with grace from thine infancy. St. John Vianney, model of filial piety. St. John Vianney, devoted servant of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. St. John Vianney, spotless lily of purity. St. John Vianney, faithful imitator of the sufferings of Christ. St. John Vianney, abyss of humility. St. John Vianney, seraph of prayer. St. John Vianney, faithful adorer of the most blessed sacrament. St. John Vianney, ardent lover of holy poverty. St. John Vianney, tender friend of the poor. St. John Vianney, penetrated with the fear of God's judgment. St. John Vianney, fortified by divine visions. St. John Vianney, who is tormented by the evil spirit. St. John Vianney, perfect model of sacerdotal virtue. St. John Vianney, firm and prudent pastor. St. John Vianney, inflamed with zeal. St. John Vianney, faithful attendant on the sick. St. John Vianney, indefatigable catechist. St. John Vianney, who did preach in words of fire. St. John Vianney, wise director of souls. St. John Vianney, especially gifted with the spirit of counsel. St. John Vianney, enlightened by light from heaven. St. John Vianney, formidable foe to Satan. St. John Vianney, compassionate with every misery. St. John Vianney, providence of the orphans. St. John Vianney, Vianney, Saint John Vianney, favored with the gift of miracles. Saint John Vianney, who did reconcile so many sinners to God. Saint John Vianney, who did confirm so many of the just in the ways of virtue. Saint John Vianney, who did chase the sweetness of death. Saint John Vianney, who does now rejoice in the glory of heaven. Saint John Vianney, who give joy to those who invoke thee. Saint John Vianney, heavenly patron of parish priests. St. John Vianney, model and patron of directors of souls. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Christ, hear us. Pray for us, blessed Jean-Marie Vianney. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, who did bestow upon blessed Jean-Marie Vianney wonderful pa pastoral zeal and a great fervor for prayer and penance, grant we beseech thee that by his example and intercession we may be able to gain the souls of our brethren for Christ and with them attain to everlasting glory through the same Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. St. John Vianney, priest of ours, Pray for our priests and pray for us.
of your body and blood, that we may always experience in ourselves the fruits of your redemption, who live and reign with God the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. the divine praises. Blessed be God. Blessed be God. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Blessed be the great Mother of God, Mary most holy. Blessed be the great Mother of God, Mary most holy. Blessed be 
blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. our novena so uh, for all those who are here present thank you so much for your presence for your prayers and what a great gift and blessing to be able to be with Jesus in the most blessed sacrament for nine days in a row that's wonderful um, also for those who join us via live stream thank you for your presence online please as I mentioned please continue to pray for our priests and for an increase in vocations I just have a couple shout-outs. I want to thank uh, Don, Don Raymond, who's uh, hiding upstairs, and he did make all the uh, live streaming possible. Um, I thank uh, Ruth for her help, and Sacristan, and all the other parishioners that helped out in one way or another, the servers that helped out in a couple nights. But more importantly, it's I also thank uh, Father Alex and Father Labrie for being here every single night, praying with us, praying for priests, praying for vocations. It's such a gift. It's such a need. And so, um, and as you know, as those here in the Fort Kent Parish know, this is my last, my last official 
uh, act as your friendly neighborhood seminarian for the summer, but um, I just want to extend my great gratitude and thanks for all that you have all done for me this summer. It's been a great enriching experience for me and I hope it was for you um, as I begin to travel. Um, I ask for your prayers for a safe travel to my destinations, but also for continued form, uh, formation in the priesthood. Um, and also pray for, as I keep saying, pray for vocations in your own families too. So, but God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you.